Welcome to this presentation covering sexual harassment. Let's begin. We have four topics that we're going to talk about in this presentation. The first is kind of an overview of kind of the history of sexual harassment. And then we're going to talk about the two categories of sexual harassment that we recognize in the law. The first is called quid pro quo, and the second is hostile work environment. Third, we're going to discuss how an employer becomes liable for sexual incidents that might happen in the workforce and how he, uh, the employer might avoid liability. And finally, we'll talk about other ways outside of the Title VII model that uh, can cause liability to arise in a sexual harassment situation. Um, those can be tort claims and or criminal claims. So let's begin. What is sexual harassment? This is an issue or a topic that has dramatically changed um, in our society um, in the last, uh, we'll say 50 years, but probably if you go before that, even, even in other ways. A behavior that was once uh, uh, not necessarily recognized as sexual harassment might be recognized today. Um, and so in certain respects, uh, there is uh, a less of this behavior. On the other hand, generally our culture has become um, more open and more um, expressive um, about personal sexual issues. And so in some senses, uh, sexual harassment has probably become less common. In some senses become more common. It's evolved. Um, it's a phenomenon that uh, changes with each new uh, iteration of society. But um, human nature is human nature. And so it's not going away. There's no perfect fix that's going to stop sexual harassment from occurring, from occurring as long as we have a workforce that is diverse. And so we're going to see that continue to be an issue. And HR managers and legal professionals who work in the area of HR law are going to contend with this. And so it's more a matter of reducing and managing the risk than eliminating the risk. The risk is never going to completely go away. We're going to always confront these issues. It's also important, especially with this topic of sexual harassment, that the individuals managing this be aware of where the current uh, social moment is. And we'll see as we look at this in a little more detail that uh, people's perspective on sexual harassment has gone through several generations of change. So the law hasn't so much changed. That's not so much of a factor in this, but the people who would be in the jury pool have changed. And the employees with whom you work and support and assist are going to be part of that changing value system. And so it is important that HR managers and legal professionals know what the current uh, perspective is on these issues and recognize as that as it as it evolves. Um, sexual harassment sexual harassment claims um, historically were not very common. Part of that is because this isn't a claim that has been recognized forever. Um, it really only became generally recognized in the law in the 1980s, well after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. Even uh, then, though, it was a fairly rare category, I think in part because um, it was an embarrassing topic for a potential plaintiff to uh, bring up. Also, in many cases, the person who had been subject to sexual harassment uh, did not necessarily lose money as a result of it. Uh, maybe he or she just left that place of employment um, and moved on to a different opportunity. Um, and so they may not have actually been out of work for a period of time. So those are some reasons why it was less likely to kind of percolate into a lawsuit. In the 1980s and 1990s, we did see an increase in this category, and certainly corporations became more aware of the concern. Still, though, there weren't a lot of cases that went to trial, and one of the reasons was, well, one of the reasons was lack of damages, as we talked about before. Um, oftentimes, these don't result in termination situations, although sometimes they do. Also, there was a level of embarrassment on kind of both ends. Uh, the plaintiff really didn't want to go to trial, and neither did the defendant. And in those cases, not surprisingly, both sides figured out a way to settle it. Uh, the textbook focuses on the defendant side, the defendant's 
desire to settle these cases, and certainly that is the case. Uh, large corporations always want to, or I don't say always, but certainly in the majority of cases want to settle really any type of employment dispute. They're so expensive for those corporations to handle. I don't really know if there's so much of an embarrassment factor for the corporation. Um, certainly if it were a high ranking person within the corporation, there might be an embarrassment factor. But if it's a large corporation and the person who allegedly harassed isn't a senior executive, I don't think embarrassment is usually the reason why the case is settled. So I will quibble a little bit with, with some of the, the textbook comments. But generally speaking, certainly no corporation wants to be subject to bad publicity. And there is certainly the possibility in sexual harassment cases that there be bad publicity, as there is the potential for bad publicity in almost all of these types of cases. Um, we'll talk more specifically uh, later on, probably in a second lecture, but employer liability is going to turn on what the employer does. It's not, doesn't really usually turn, it, it can turn, but probably more commonly than not, it's not going to turn on what happened between the two employees. That dynamic usually isn't what causes the greatest liability for the employers. We'll explore what that, what that missing component is when we get to a later part, but I'm going to kind of tease you a little bit with that. But it's going to be how the employer has established standards and how the employer has enforced those standards. Again, we'll talk more about that going forward. So the big case, or the first big case in this area was Meritor Savings. Uh, this was a case in 1986. Um, and in this case, the US Supreme Court said, yes, sexual harassment is an actionable claim under Title VII. And it, it established not only was it an actionable claim, uh, under a quid pro quo basis, probably that was already, <coughs> excuse me, the law, but a hostile work environment claim could be advanced under Meritor Savings. We'll talk about Meritor Savings in a little bit more detail uh, in a minute. But let's just pause here and think about the issue. What is hostile work environment? It's when things are sexually charged and they make people very uncomfortable. But there's no rape. There's no, uh, you've got to date me or you're not going to get the promotion. There's no, you got to do this in order to get this. It's just a really uncomfortable working environment. Um, very, uh, it's inappropriate, obviously, but uh, there is no actual you're being fired if you don't do this type of thing. Um, so you can see how it doesn't really fit in tightly with the whole Title VII type claims uh, because there really isn't any direct adverse job action that's happening. We'll talk about how the U.S. Supreme Court addresses that issue in a few minutes, but, but that's one of the reasons, I guess, that sexual harassment is kind of late to the party in terms of an, a claim under a Title VII. As we go through this chapter, even while I'm talking about sexual harassment, be aware that we also have in addition to sexual harassment, all the other categories of harassment, racial harassment, color harassment, religious harassment, age harassment, disability harassment, gender harassment more generally, all of those are going to follow the same legal paradigm that we're going to talk about with respect to sexual harassment. So be sure as you're hearing it to recognize this material has applicability beyond just the sexual um, aspects. Even though the Meritor Savings case came up before uh, uh, the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas situation, certainly the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas situation was a watershed for sexual harassment. Uh, many of y'all perhaps don't remember it. Uh, this was a time when uh, uh, Clarence Thomas, who eventually became a U.S. Supreme Court Justice and currently is a U.S. Supreme Court Justice, he was uh, going through his confirmation hearings, and um, he uh, is an African-American man, and he had been previously the head, actually, of the EOC, and while he was at the EOC, the Equal Opportunity uh, Commission, uh, one of his uh, colleagues, I think she was a subordinate to him, she was, is also an attorney, was Anita Hill. Uh, both uh, 
Justice Thomas and Miss Hill were are, are African American. They are both politically conservative individuals, and they were both working for the EEOC as attorneys. Um, Miss Hill alleged that Mr. Thomas engaged in many sexually sexual jokes, sexual um, innuendos, things like that. She didn't claim that he was uh, propositioning her or telling, or threatening to fire her if she refused to have a relationship with him or anything like that. But basically, what she was saying was it was a very sexually charged environment. Other co-workers disputed her version of the allegations. So there was a, and Mr. Thomas himself disputed it. So there was a variety of perspectives being advanced. And it was a fairly, uh, almost like a whodunit type of situation. And he said, she said, there were people who felt very strongly that Miss Hill was telling the truth. After all, she shared Mr. Thomas's political views. And so it was hard to see why she would be uh, coming forward uh, um, to sabotage his candidacy if it hadn't really happened. On the other hand, uh, many people felt that this was an attempt to present a, a stereotypical image of African American men in this society. Um, that, 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 that perspective, uh, obviously very offensive perspective that some people unfortunately had that um, uh, African American men uh, would behave inappropriately in the work environment. Anyway, th that dynamic was also there. So uh, race was in the mix, gender was in the mix, politics was in the mix, sex was in the mix. There's just so, so many different dynamics to the situation. Anyway, eventually uh, Justice Thomas was confirmed and uh, he has continued to uh, describe the behavior that he received as a high-tech lynching was the term that he used for how he was treated uh, during that confirmation process. Ms. Hill continues to uh, uh, present her version of events that she felt that everything that she said was accurate and was truthful and she stands by her testimony. So you can go lots of different ways with that, but it was definitely a watershed moment. And because of the heightened attention that sexual harassment got, employers saw a dramatic increase in the number of complaints. People who might not have identified what was happening to them in the workplace as sexual harassment, or perhaps even a problem, suddenly were looking at that behavior in a different way. So this was a big cultural moment for us where we were looking at it and saying, Wait, we might have looked at it one way once, and now we're looking at the same issue in a different way. We'll see as we go a little bit farther, uh, and we'll talk about this later on, but we have the Felliger, uh, uh, Farragher and Ellerth opinions in late um, 1990s that um, presented another part of that cultural paradigm. This one wasn't one that the general public was necessarily tuned into, but it's uh, one that the corporate culture was, was clued into. Prior to Far Farragher and Ellerth, uh, corporations might have had some sexual harassment training, but it wasn't a big deal. After these two cases, really an industry developed in the area of sexual harassment training and reporting. And so definitely this impacted the, co the corporate workplace culture. And we'll talk more about that as we get to that section of the material. Despite the efforts, or perhaps because of the efforts, depending upon your perspective on these issues, uh, sexual harassment uh, continues to be a very a major issue in our culture. It is one that uh, seems to continue. There seems to continue to be uh, abuse happening in this area. And most recently, we have had another kind of iteration of the same, same types of things that we saw in the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas situation. But there are some differences this time. For one thing, and we see this with the Me Too, Me Too movement and the Harvey Weinstein situation, and we've seen it affect others too. Uh, Charlie Rose, Matt Lauer, um, uh, many others, I'm drawing a blank for other names, but um, 
a big difference between this version and the one with Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas is that um, while many people believed Miss Hill, many people also believed Mr. Thomas. Nowadays, I would say that um, women are much more likely to be believed. And in fact, some people are concerned that uh, simply being accused seems to, in our culture now, equate to you must be guilty if you've been accused, that somehow or another it's not believable that somebody would ever lie about something like this. Um, and so we, we've kind of gone from never believe the victim to always believe the victim or the person who's saying that he or she's a victim. But this has raised the, uh, the uh, awareness of sexual harassment and um, it has also probably reminded us that it continues to be a major problem. We haven't seen legislative changes, but certainly when these issues are out there in the culture, it's going to affect the jury pool and it's going to affect the employees, what their expectations are. And as a result of the Me Too movement, there's been a significant increase in the number of sexual harassment complaints that are being filed. So we are definitely seeing the evolution continue in this area. And uh, very likely we'll have another iteration of this because I mean, the bottom line is human nature isn't gonna change. Um, we're going to continue to deal with these issues as long as we have work to, to perform. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the two flavors, there are two categories of sexual harassment we have, the quid pro quo and the hostile work environment. Most likely we will save employer liability and tort and criminal claims to another lecture. So let's, con let's continue and talk about what, um, what, what do we mean when we mean sexual harassment? I've been throwing the term around, but I haven't really explained what it is. And again, defining what it is is a large part of the challenge. Um, what what uh, race discrimination is pretty easy to define. If you treat somebody differently because of his or her race, that's race discrimination. Um, you know, religious discrimination is pretty easy to define. If you treat someone different because of his or her um, religion, that's racial uh, religious discrimination. But when we're talking about sexual harassment. I mean is saying, hey, that's a pretty dress. Is that sexual harassment? Or my, you look handsome with a beard. Is that sexual harassment? Where is the line? And it's not intuitive necessarily where that line would be. And probably that line shifts as the culture shifts. So it's not a static situation. Let's first of all talk about what isn't sexual harassment. One thing that is not sexual harassment are consensual relationships. Now, they have to be truly consensual. I mean, if your boss says, you want to date me, uh, by the way, we're going through layoffs, and I certainly want people working with me who uh, are supportive of me and my efforts. So one more time, do you want to date me? <laughs> that would be an example. If you say yes, it might appear that it's consensual, but it's really not consensual because implied in that is, and if you don't date me, maybe you'll be laid off. But if it truly is consensual, then it's not forbidden. And we'll talk about, that really comes under the idea of welcomeness. One of the things that makes something sexual harassment is that it's not welcome contact or, or communication between the individuals. Another thing that sexual harassment is, is it's not this kind of Puritan, place where nobody ever cracks a joke or notices uh, the genders of the people that they're working with. It is not a place devoid of sexuality. Um, having uh, compliments, having casual comments about even sexual matters does not make an environment uh, a case of sexual harassment. It has to actually be pretty pretty out there before it's going to cross that line into sexual harassment. You can have a lot of banter and you're still not over that line. Now let me pause and say here that that's the legal line. But if you think about it, most employers uh, will, will so, so let's imagine this is, well, I don't mean to insult uh, Amish people, but let's say this is the Amish line where there's no, no, no skin is being shown. There's no dirty jokes. There's no dating in the workplace. 
um, it's like a Queen Victoria era work, working environment. Just none of that comes up. Up here we have sexual harassment where it's just absolutely unlawful behavior. Employers don't want to have their policy be, well, we just have to make sure that, you know, gosh, we're, we're below the legal limit here. They don't want to be up here. And why don't they want to be up here? Well, if they're that close to the legal line, they're, they're um, allowing for lots of behavior that isn't constructive. I mean, even if behavior isn't sexual harassment, does sexual banter in the workplace really help productivity? I mean, even if it's not harassing, even if everybody's enjoying it, it's a distraction. It, people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so employers usually set the bar much lower than the legal level. And that way, if somebody says, well, look, gosh, somebody did something at this level, then the employer can say, oh, hey, we'll say Bob did something at this level. Hey, Bob, you violated our policy. You may not have violated the law, but you violated our policy. And so usually there's a pretty significant divide between the two because the employer, yes, the employer wants to make sure that this line isn't crossed. So they want to have a nice comfort zone between the legal standard and what their standard is. And they also don't want there to be a lot of shenanigans in the workplace that aren't constructive. So uh, what an employer says this is appropriate is usually going to be quite a bit more demanding than what the law provides. Um, obviously, most sexual harassment situations take place between males and females, um, but you do have the potential to have um, same-sex sexual harassment. We'll talk about that, and that does not necessarily mean that there's a sexual orientation issue, although it can. Um, certainly, uh, males can be harassed by other males or by females, and certainly females can be harassed by other females or by males. Uh, males are less likely to make claims of sexual harassment. My guess is that it's less frequent that males experience it, number one. And number two, there may also be some heightened level of embarrassment factor uh, with a male who is subject to that. We've talked before about this, but I'm just going to reiterate it one more time, and I'm sure I'll say it more additional times. Sexual harassment is not covered by Title VII. There have been a couple of circuits, uh, which are federal courts, the appellate level courts, that have uh, held that sexual harassment is implicitly covered in Title VII when there's the reference to sex. Um, and mainly the way that those courts have done that is to say that uh, a stereotype that we associate with sex is that males are going to be attracted romantically to females and females will be romantically attracted to males. That's our stereotype. And when people vary from the stereotype and fail to meet the norms that we have with that particular gender, um, then that is an example that would be having a different sexual orientation being gay or lesbian, in other words. And so because you aren't meeting sexual stereotypes, you could consider that to be a type of sex discrimination. So a couple of circuits, maybe three, have agreed, I think it's two, have agreed to that. Our circuit, the Fifth Circuit, has not agreed to that at all. I would be very surprised if our Fifth Circuit were to take that step. Um, so if we see sexual orientation being included within Title VII, it will happen most likely in one of two ways. A legislative change by the Congress, wherein they will add sexual orientation as a protected category. The other way would be for the U.S. Supreme Court to interpret the term sex that is in Title VII to include sexual orientation. That could happen. Uh, that would be somewhat surprising for it to happen because of some previous decisions. Usually the Supreme Court doesn't like to kind of overturn its own precedent. It has, it has some flexibility. It wouldn't be absolutely uh, inconsistent for it to do so, but it's unlikely, I would say, in my opinion, for it to do so. So I think the more likely path would be um, to see a... Uh, a legislative change by Congress. But at this point, that doesn't seem to be on anybody's top agenda. So most likely for some significant period of time to come, sexual orientation will not be a covered category under either state law or federal law. 
let's advance from here. This is a case, I'm not going to draw a lot of attention to it. I was trying to show that um, just because a person, just because sexual stuff is happening in the workforce does not mean that it's sexual harassment. In this case, the boss commented because the worker, the, the woman, was dressed inappropriately. She wore very short skirts and uh, she, her job was to be a receptionist. And so the boss was saying, look, this, these are too short. You need to dress more professionally. He never expressed any sexual interest. Um, she complained about the boss criticizing her appearance. After that happened, her workload increased and the boss stopped talking to her. Then she was discharged. She's saying, look, I was discriminated against because of my gender. Um, but in fact, no, she wasn't. The court found that the workplace wasn't hostile at all. There was no quid pro quo behavior. There was no hostile work environment because there wasn't anything sexual going on here. You don't need to know the name of this course. I'm just kind of offering it to show an example of not an unusual situation. I mean, not probably as common as others, but not every time that there's a discussion of something potentially sexual, that necessarily means there's a harassment situation. It's very appropriate for employers to enforce dress codes and to talk with somebody who is dressing inappropriately. Um, my, 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 my father, this is back in the, I guess, in the 80s, I uh, remember one time he had to talk to, he, he worked in an industrial situation, and he had to talk to one of the uh, women workers because she wasn't wearing a bra. And uh, it was a kind of a physical job, and so as a result, she would sometimes be sweaty, and uh, it wasn't modest because the sweat would, she'd be wearing a t-shirt, and the sweat would uh, cause the shirt to uh, follow her form and so it was uh, not a modest situation and the co-workers uh, were distracted by this aspect of her appearance and so uh, my dad had a talk with her about you know you need to wear something underneath that t-shirt that won't allow your physique to be so obvious um, I'm sure he was embarrassed by that conversation but it was absolutely appropriate and uh, not anything wrong to have had that conversation, but it was the better thing to do. So don't feel like you can't talk about this um, dress code compliance with workers um, and somehow find yourself crossing the line. Now, it's probably a good idea if you are someone of the opposite gender from the person you're talking with and uh, you're concerned about the revealingness of their clothes, to have another person present for that conversation uh, so you don't have any potential that there be a misunderstanding about it. So sexual harassment is a category of employment discrimination. Um, harassment is a subcategory. If you imagine the universe of employment discrimination, sexual harassment is just one category in this larger universe. Let's see how EOC has described sexual harassment. Um, unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other a verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature constitute sexual harassment when, so these behaviors are going to be sexual harassment if one of the following conditions are present. You just need one. So the first one is our quid pro quo. Before we get into quid pro quo, um, there's a couple of different ways of using this expression. Quid pro quo literally means this for that. But sometimes people say tit for tat. And, and I, know I, did, I don't mean that in a coarse way. I just mean this is an expression in English, tit for tat. And I'm not meaning it in any kind of salacious manner. Um, this for that, quit tit for tat, and you can see with the terminology, uh, or let, let's kind of see what the definition the EOC has provided. The conduct is made, either, made there, is made either exclusively, exclusively, or explicitly. This is what it should be explicitly. Let me just make that change. Explicitly or implicitly, which means it's implied, a term or condition of employment. So let me give you some examples. Um, date me and I'll promote you. Um, have sex with me and um, you won't be on the layoff list. 
um, uh, that obviously that's very direct and explicit or but it can be implied um, and you can see that demonstrating the adverse employment action is pretty easy in that situation. You'll remember the prima facie case, the employee has to establish four things, that he or she is a member of a protected group. Well, of course, gender is a protected group. That he or she was qualified for the job. Well, presumably they were qualified for their job. Um, that there was an adverse action, something like failure to promote, demotion, termination, failure to hide. And that there was one other characteristic and certainly the quid pro quo aspect evidence could qualify for that fourth characteristic. So quid pro quo is pretty straightforward. And as I think we, we all would have agreed that this was a category for uh, uh, sexual harassment uh, earlier than the second category. The second category though is probably the more important category in that this is the more common allegation. We see quid pro quo cases, but they're not as common as the hostile work environment. So let's consider the hostile work environment. The conduct is unreasonable and interferes with job performance or creates a hostile or offensive working environment. In this situation, nobody's asking anybody out on dates. Nobody's threatening to fire them. It's just an environment that is very sexually charged and that because of the high level of, of discussions of sex or jokes or touching or things like that, it has interfered with the ability of this worker to do his or her work. So both are types of sexual harassment, but you can see how they're really going to look pretty different on the ground. And so as we, we talk about these, always keep in mind, well, what type of sexual harassment is the allegation in this case? It's important to know which type because we'll see as we consider whether employer liability exists, that there's very different answers. We'll have one answer if it's category one and we'll have a very different answer if it's category two. So both forms have been adopted by courts. They're both considered unlawful sexual harassment under Title VII. And here's maybe a bit more of a definition about this. Let's consider the quid pro quo sexual harassment. Sexual harassment in which the harasser requests sexual activity from the victim in exchange for workplace benefits. The good news for the plaintiff is that there's usually some records of this. Um, there's usually some emails. You know, oftentimes the harasser starts out more low key. Um, hey, you want to grab some lunch? Ah, pretty dress you're wearing. Nice tie, I like that. And escalates it maybe when he or she is getting the response or at least hoping to get the response. They're kind of testing the water, so to speak. And so there's likely to be other witnesses or some increased telephone calls or text messages or things like that. And so those cases are oftentimes relatively easy for the uh, victim to uh, present as, hey, here's some evidence to support it. May not have all of the evidence of every single interaction, but may have enough evidence to show that there is a point of concern. Let's consider the second category. So this is, so this is the first category. Number one, this tracks with number one. Number two, tracks with number two. This is ha sexual harassment in which the harasser creates an abusive, offensive, or intimidating environment for the victim. While touching may be involved, touching is not a requirement. Um, so, hey, you want a back massage? That kind of stuff, certainly it can filter over to quid pro quo. More likely it's in a hostile work environment situation um, if it's just a back rub or something along those lines. Touching can be hostile work environment, can be quid pro quo. You don't have to have touching in order to have a hostile work environment. Um, it's oftentimes a more subtle situation. Um, there can be email trails and, and cell phone trails and things along those lines, um, but it can also be more likely verbal or visual type of, of things, and so there isn't always as much of a paper trail with a hostile work environment case as with a quid pro quo. Let's consider a couple of scenarios. So Mary and Bob are part of the cheese production team at Heath Dairy. All the team members share a harmonious work relationship. 
However, a calendar featuring a semi-nude woman in a sexually suggestive pose on Bob's desks makes Mary uncomfortable. She asks Bob to remove it, but Bob does not oblige, insisting that he has been getting that same brand of calendar for five years and sees no need to replace it now. To file and prevail in a sexual harassment uh, claim, Mary must prove that the calendar creates a hostile or abusive work environment. So we can see that Mary, if she's going to be successful at all, her only shot is going to be with a hostile work environment because Bob hasn't made any request for sexual activity with Mary, nor has he suggested any kind of workplace benefit. It sounds like probably Mary and Bob are peers, co-workers, and so probably Bob doesn't even have the ability to fire Mary or promote Mary or something like that. Now, I would say that a, a single picture of a semi-nude woman in a sexually suggestive pose is very unlikely to qualify as sexual harassment, uh, hostile working environment type claim. Um, but certainly this could be one fact of many, and so this would be uh, maybe one piece of evidence that could advance Mary's claim, but she's frankly going to need more under these circumstances to make a legal claim. Now, if I were the HR manager in, at Heath Dairy, would, and Mary comes to me and says, I'm really weirded out by this whole poster thing, um, am I going to go by Bob's office and see some scantily clad person in a picture? Am I telling him that's not okay, make it go away? Of course I am. What's the benefit to having this picture? If he wants to put it in the drawer, you know, of his desk, maybe that's okay with me, I guess, but I'm not, I, I'm, there's no upside for the employer for saying, ah, oh, Bob can keep it. I mean, how is that helping productivity? It's giving Mary some ammunition for a claim. It's probably a source of distraction for Bob and perhaps other people in the working environment. So the fact that it's probably not a hostile work environment, successful hostile work environment claim, doesn't mean that the employer ought to suck it up and say, oh, is not sexual harassment, Mary, so I guess you're out of luck. No, perfectly fine for the employer to have a much lower bar before it, uh, th that it takes action on. And uh, in fact, not only is it appropriate, it's uh, a very logical step for the employer to take. Let's consider the next scenario. Mary's a partner in a law firm and she shows special interest in Bob, a new associate in the law firm. Associate is a term for a new attorney who is a going to work at the law firm for a few years in the hopes of making partner. Mary frequently makes sexual overtones to Bob and expects him, frequently made sexual overtones to Bob and expected him to get physically intimate with her if he wanted to be a senior attorney in the firm. However, Bob's refusal prompted Mary to tell him that he was not suitable to be a, a senior attorney and she, and she also started treating him badly in front of other employees. Unable to bear the harassment any longer, Bob quits his job and filed a complaint with the EOC for sexual harassment. The law firm would be strictly liable for sexual harassment because Mary's a supervisor. The supervisor's actions are considered those of the employer. So this is, this one was category two, hostile work environment, but this would be a quid pro quo. Mary said, have sex with me. Uh, to get this promotion. Bob didn't, and now Bob has filed the claim. Now, Mary actually had the power to actually do what she's threatening. She had the power to either help him get to that next step or impede his progress. And so just like if Mary had discriminated against somebody because of their race or their religion, Mary's actions would um, implicate the employer. The employer would be liable as well as Mary. But um, in this case, it's, it's sexual harassment, it's same same situation. Bob is being denied a promotion. So Mary's actions as a supervisor are imputed to the employer under that respondeat superior, vicarious liability idea that we've discussed before. So unfortunately for Mary and the employer, uh, Bob probably has a pretty good claim if he isn't made senior attorney. And even, I guess he's quit, so even uh, otherwise he's probably got a good claim. Meritor savings, we've already talked about this case a little bit. This is a big one. This was really the first one, or the first U.S. Supreme Court case that talked about hostile work environment sexual harassment. Um, 
uh, so the question that the case was looking at, but was uh, before we go any further, you need to know Meritor Savings. You don't need to know Vincent. You just need to know this part of the name, Meritor Savings. You need to know it's holding, and here you can see is a very brief summary of the holding of law side at the end of the case, and it's significant to employment law. And of course, here we're talking about the fact that this is establishing hostile work environment sexual harassment. And so this is the first time that we know for sure that it is covered. In this situation, the plaintiff uh, was sexually harassed by her supervisor. Um, she claimed that um, uh, he, uh, uh, forced her to have sex many times and uh, actually raped her and um, uh, exposed her, himself to her very according to her allegations a very very abusive situation uh, she never complained about it and um, the US Supreme Court said um, it, it sounds like it might be a quid, quid pro quo case but even if we look at it as a hostile work environment case um, and it said that an employer can be liable for hostile environment sexual harassment claimed by a supervisor even if the employer was unaware of the conduct because remember I said she never complained um, she never reported the harassment to anyone well the well meritor saving or excuse me the Supreme Court is saying when it's a supervisor who's doing the harassing there isn't the requirement that the employer be notified because the supervisor knows because I mean if it's true that he or she's really harassing then obviously he knows he's doing it and he represents the employer for this under the respondent superior theory the court also noted the guidelines issued by the EOC specify that sexual harassment leading to non-economic injury was a form of sexual discrimination prohibited by Title VII. So it's easy when somebody's fired, hey, I refuse to have sex with Bob, I was fired. Well, there's an economic injury there. I'm out of work. I'm losing my paycheck. But many hostile work environment cases, the person is not obviously out any money. They're still working on the assembly line. They're just miserable. They're still getting their paycheck. So the injury is non-economic. The court recognized that plaintiffs could establish violations of Title VII by proving the discrimination based upon sex has created a hostile or abusive work environment. So it doesn't, we don't need an economic injury in order to establish an, a hostile work environment claim. So here's a contrast between quid pro quo and hostile work environment. So here's kind of the definition. Workplace benefit promised or withheld uh, from, this should be from victim, I apologize, from victim by harasser in exchange for sexual activity sexual activity by the victim and of course what the sexual activity is doesn't have to be actual sex it could be will you go out on a date with me will you kiss me will you perform this act that might fall short of actual sexual intercourse as we noted before oftentimes there's going to be some kind of evidentiary trail maybe paper trail maybe electronic trail and let's contrast that with the hostile work environment what does the a victim need to prove in order to establish a hostile work environment? Well, here she needs to prove that the behavior was unwanted. More likely, it's described as unwelcome. Obviously, if the victim is participating freely with, about the contact, there is no hostile environment. I mean, the employer might not be happy that the uh, env employment environment is so sexually charged, but if nobody's disliking it, it's not hostile. In addition, the behavior has to be directed toward the victim's gender. We'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by this in a second. It also um, has to create, so uh, usual, uh, well, it has to create a hostile or abusive work environment. And this we're really getting at, is it sufficiently severe and or pervasive? Um, the workplace is not supposed to be, you know, Miss Manners finishing school where everybody behaves just so appropriately. They lift their pinky when they're drinking their coffee and they wear white gloves and they would, you know, never wear white after uh, Memorial Day or whatever the, the thing is. You know, this is not an etiquette society. It's a rough and tumble industrial 
environment in some cases. And so uh, the fact that mm, there's some, some salty language, some sexual comments, uh, that in and of itself is not going to cross the line in most cases. It really needs to permeate the environment and uh, really be severe or pervasive. And another requirement to establish this um, hostile work environment is that it has to unreasonably interfere with the victim's ability to do his or her job. So let's say that uh, the only person who tends to crack these jokes uh, travels most of the time and he or she's only in the office once one day a month. Well, it's hard to argue that unless this person's super offensive, that that's going to unreasonably interfere with the victim's ability to do his or her job. Um, so you have to consider the totality. Uh, how, how much contact is there? Uh, how frequent is the sexual banter or whatever going on? Um, and so it's, it's, it, you have to be able to point to things in the, vict uh, in the victim's performance that are suffering. If the victim is an all-star worker and continues to be an all-star worker, it's going to be hard to argue that they have found that their uh, work performance is unreasonably interfered with. Now, again, that's the legal standard for the victim to win the case. But the employer isn't going to want to wait to address the problem until people's job performance are diminishing. That would be stupid for the employer. So again, the legal bar to establish this is pretty high. You got to have some pretty darn good evidence to be able to successfully claim sexual harassment. But the bar that the employer is going to want to enforce is going to be significantly lower. They want to stop it when it's about to cross this line. So really. Um, in my experience, employers really don't want sexual con comments or innuendos in the workplace really at all. And so um, the, the, the bar is pretty removed from where the legal line is. And employers are perfectly able to enforce the, um, the lower line. I mean, that goes back to that employment at will. So let's say that, um, bah, well, let's go back to our story here. In this situation, Bob with these semi-nude pictures. And let's say I'm the HR person and I call Bob and I'll say, Bob, you know, these pictures, that, that's just not appropriate. It's not uh, conducive to a professional work environment. Um, and uh, I'm going to fire you because you had these pictures. Um, you, uh, that would be perfectly lawful for the employer to do. The employer can say and can fire anyone for any reason. Now, if, you know, Teresa in the work environment has a semi-nude picture of a man in a sexually suggestive pose, then the employer can't fire Bob and not fire Teresa. But if the employer has a very uh, conservative approach on these issues, it can fire whomever it wants. There's no kind of reverse sexual harassment idea. You know, there's no particular rights that the alleged harasser has to some kind of due process protection under the law or they can't be terminated if the behavior isn't really egregious. Now most employers probably wouldn't fire under these circumstances because it doesn't seem like it's really a severe situation. If Bob's a good worker, tell him to remove the picture, tell him not to, not to do anything close to that line again and go about to document the situation and go about your business. Um, but it certainly would be okay for the employer to go ahead and dismiss Bob, assuming that the employer has consistently dismissed people for this level of sexual behavior in the workplace. And of course it has to affect negatively a condition, a term or condition of, of a victim's employment. This is that um, third element of the prima facie case. So let's talk about the unwelcome requirement. Oops, there we go. Um, it is an absolute requirement. If the victim welcomes the behavior, then guess what? It's not harassment. Uh, but the victim isn't required to say, Bob, I find your comments unwelcome. No. Um, so whenever one is engaging in 
sexual banter. Uh, one shouldn't assume that just because the other person isn't objecting that they necessarily appreciate the banter. It's socially uncomfortable in many cases for somebody to say, wait a second, I don't really appreciate those types of jokes. And the fact that they don't say that doesn't mean that the, that the uh, person making the jokes can just assume that they're welcome. Uh, a better course of action is number one, not to go into the sexual uh, arena at all. But if you do, for whatever reason, to say, hey, you know, I, I, have the, I heard this off-color joke the other day. Would you mind if I told it? And then maybe after you tell the joke, you say, I will make sure I didn't offend you with that joke, did I? Because if I did, I'll, I won't tell you those kind of jokes in the future. If you, for some reason you needed to go there, that would be the appropriate way of handling those situations um, to, to get that agreement. Uh, that it wasn't unwelcome. Let's consider this scenario. So Bob's interest in an intimate relationship with the supervisor Mary was genuine at the beginning, but he loses interest after a while. So after Bob communicates to Mary he doesn't want to see her anymore, um, he, she stops pursuing the romantic relationship. Sometime after that, Bob and Mary have a professional falling out. Uh, Bob cannot successfully assert that the behavior that occurred during his relationship with Mary is evidence of sexual harassment because it was welcome at the time that it occurred. So Bob and Mary dated. They broke up. Mary didn't retaliate against Bob. Um, so Bob isn't going to have a successful claim. Now, of course, there can be evidentiary issues. I mean, Bob might, his story might change. He might say, well, I never was interested in dating Mary. It really wasn't genuine interest, but I, I felt she would fire me if I didn't date her. Or Bob might say, well, yeah, I willingly dated her, but when I lost interest, then Mary started retaliating. So even though in this fact scenario as I presented it, yes, Mary doesn't have any exposure, neither does the employer, uh, Bob's testimony can be a wild card in these situations. And that's one of the reasons why employers prefer for, especially when it, within a reporting relationship, that they're not be dating. Um, we'll talk more about this topic uh, uh, later on in this presentation. So severe and pervasive, let's go back to that one. This is, it has to be sufficiently severe or pervasive in order for it to be sexual harassment. And this is usually the sticking point. Um, we have to decide, or the jury ultimately has to decide, whether it is so severe and so pervasive to amount to an unreasonable interference with an employee's ability to perform. Usually a single occurrence is not going to be at that level, because again, workplaces don't have to be Miss Manners boarding schools. Um, but a single event can cross the line. Um, certainly, for example, a rape would cross the line, but things significantly short of that could cross the line. Um, so it, 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 uh, it, it, one or two bad incidents can meet the qual qualification for severe or pervasive, or lots and lots of relatively small incidents can cross that line, or some combination of those things. So you either need it to be really severe or pretty pervasive, or some combination of those. We're going to talk about Harris v. Forklift Systems in a bit, um, but the important one important idea to get out of that case um, is that um, there doesn't have to be psychological damage to the victim in order to be able to be successful in a sexual harassment claim. So we're not talking about a mental health issue necessarily although sometimes that can play a role that the person who's been subject to sexual harassment is experiencing, you know, depression or anxiety or, or something along those lines. Certainly that can be evidence and it can be powerful evidence, but the person, again, doesn't need a psychiatric diagnosis to be able to advance under a hostile work environment theory. So let's consider what is going to point us toward the, the, the existence of a hostile or abusive work environment. Well, of course, one is going to be the frequency, the pervasiveness, also its severity. So we need to, I mean, ideally, if you're the plaintiff, you want to have both of these. But if you have, if you, you need to have at least one of these, I guess. Um, 
for sexual harassment claims in the case of rape, the plaintiff does not need to show that the offending activity was sufficiently per severe and or pervasive if, if it was egregious enough the one time it occurred. So again, really extreme situations, even if they occur once, can cross the line into a hostile work environment circumstance, certainly. Uh, the standard of whether conduct is abusive should be that of a reasonable person in the plaintiff's situation. Um, the reasonable person standard is something we've talked about before, and let me just flag a couple terms. It's an objective standard, so it's not focusing, in the case of Harris, it's not focusing on Ms. Harris's perspective, her quirks, her individual level of sensitivity. It's not focusing upon the uh, uh, alleged harasser's perspective, his particular experiences and his uh, understanding of the situation. Um, I like to think of it as kind of the fly on the wall, the disinterested person who observed the whole situation, doesn't have any dog in the fight, doesn't have any agenda, would he or she have looked at it and said, nah, it seems like a hostile work environment to me. Now, obviously, um, everybody thinks of himself or herself as a reasonable person. Um, and we all know people who aren't reasonable people, right? I mean, that's the, so, so we're not talking about a particular person. This is a standard in the law where it's kind of the average person in society. So it wouldn't be, you know, the, uh, we'll say the, uh, uh, the Amish person who's lived his or her entire life on a farm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. That person, though the person might be absolutely reasonable, uh, doesn't meet the kind of average idea that we have in our society. That person might be shocked by lots of things that, frankly, the average U.S. citizen in the 21st century wouldn't be that surprised by. On the other hand, the uh, the average employee at you know, Hooters or a Twin Peaks or um, a pornographic website um, would probably have a much more uh, higher expect or high, think the line is much higher and, and things that uh, the average person would find offensive. They might be like, oh, man, no big deal. I, I, I'm, I'm immune to being shocked at that. And so it's the average for the society. And so it's going to change over time. What might shock people in one generation won't necessarily shock people in another generation. There has been some move out there for some courts to adopt a reasonable victim standard. Uh, the textbook talks about this a little bit more than I think it's really happening. The reasonable person standard is not really not the reasonable harasser standard, and it's not the reasonable victim standard. It's designed to be apart from either the victim or the harasser. Um, and so it's designed to be objective. But as soon as you are looking at it through the lens of one person, you can see how some of the objectivity is going away. Now, certainly courts who have used a reasonable victim standard don't focus on the particular personality of the victim, but try to imagine that reasonable person plopped into the situation that that victim is in. And that's actually the standard that is used in Harris. It is a reasonable person in the plaintiff's particular circumstances. Um, but of course, to label that person as a victim is kind of begging the question, right? I mean, the whole issue is whether this person is a victim or not. So this is kind of a loaded approach. And I would say it's not one that we would likely see in the Fifth Circuit or in Texas state courts. Right now, I would say that a reasonable person, the plaintiff standard is, excuse me, the plaintiff's position is a standard that we've seen this U.S. Supreme Court give us more than once and would be the direction that we would expect, I think, most courts in our state to adopt and use. And so here's a description about these two standards. And as I said before, this is uh, the more uh, unusual approach. So the reasonable person standard is viewing the harassing activity from the perspective of a reasonable person in society at large. Reasonable victim is viewing the harassing behavior from the perspective of a reasonable person experiencing the harassing activity, including gender-specific sociological, cultural, and other factors. So again, it almost becomes perhaps a reasonable woman standard 
um, which of course is only half the population, so it's not that complete reasonable person standard, which in theory covers us all. So it's a little bit of a less common standard and one that is probably not as useful in our particular part of the country. Of course, if you move to a different part of the country, it's possible this perspective might be more widely accepted. So here's our, the actual kind of case brief about um, the Harris versus forklift systems. And we can see that we are now in the late 1990s. So we're a little over 10 years from the time of meritor savings. And now the issue is, must sexual harassment seriously affect an employee's psychological well-being in order to create an abusive environment that violates Title VII? The short answer is no. Now you are responsible for knowing this case. We're not going to go through the facts of the case, so don't worry about that. You need to know its name, its significance, and its holding. So here's our holding. If the environment would, be reason, would reasonably be perceived, so this is reasonable perception, reasonable person standard, it's an objective standard, and is perceived, which is a subjective standard, so now we're getting into Harris's head, as hostile or abusive, there is no need for it to be psychologically injurious in order for there to be a valid Title VII claim. So we have two. Would that fly on the wall have viewed it as hostile or abusive? And did Terrace in fact view it as hostile or offensive? We need both of those to be present. Well, having just one, either Harris being offended or that fly on the wall being offended, isn't going to be adequate. But Harris doesn't have to be some kind of psychologically ill person as a result of the situation. So Harris, um, that decision broadened the categories of hostile work environment cases that were going to be successful. Now we're going to talk about Ancale. We'll talk about more about Ancale in the sexual orientation section, but Ancale kind of straddles both areas. It's, it's an interesting case. We're not going to dive in too much into the facts, but Ancale was a subject to same-sex sexual harassment. Um, but it was not necessarily same-sex sexual harassment that was caused by a sexual attraction. That while some of the things that Ancale was put through were of a, a sexual meaning or had sexual content, they morphed into the category of hazing. Um, that the, this was a an all male kind of uh, macho environment, and so they have some hazing rituals that uh, were, I guess, intended to be somewhat demeaning to the person coming on board, and they had a sexual component to it. Anyway, Ancale sued about this, and he's saying, look, I was the victim of same-sex sexual harassment. I'm not saying that the men who did this to me were sexually attracted to me. I'm just saying it had a sexual component, and I didn't care for it, didn't like it, and feel like I'm a victim. And the court said, yeah, Ancale, you can sometimes be successful in these types of cases of same-sex sexual harassment. This, the court, well, so, so, so they opened up this category. So this is a yet one more expansion of the sexual harassment universe. Same-sex sexual harassment is a recognized claim. So let's consider a few scenarios. Bob, look at the first one here. Bob occasionally compliments his secretary when he arrives at the office saying things like, Mary, you look nice today. Or, that's a pretty dress. Obviously, these are very appropriate things to say. There's nothing in the world wrong with that. Um, Mary would not have any claim for sexual harassment. They could even be more edgy. They could be things like, Mary, your legs look nice in that dress, or um, you know, something like that, without really even being close to the line. These are universally fine, uh, you, you, and, pro, and I wouldn't recommend you go any farther, but there, there would be lots of opportunity to go farther before you would be in the area of um, a hostile work environment sexual harassment. Let's consider the next scenario. Bob is being asked for sexual favors by his boss, Mary. She would force him to meet her outside work and he would touch him inappropriately. She even promised him a promotion if he agreed to be sexually intimate with her. Bob reluctantly succumbed to Mary's demands and got a promotion. 
When he refused to engage in further sexual activity with Mary, she fired him. Yes, under these circumstances, Bob can absolutely prove quid pro quo sexual harassment. Mary and the employer are going to be on the hook for Bob's claim under these circumstances. And obviously, if Bob had resisted from the beginning and Mary had denied him the promotion or fired him, then Bob could have had a claim at that point as well. Bob and Mary work in the claims department of an insurance company. On Mary's birthday, Bob stops by her cubicle and gives her a cupcake with a heart on the frosting and asks her out on a date. Mary, having never spoken to Bob before, finds his actions strange and declines his offer. Bob does not make any more advances, but Mary finds him creepy whenever she sees him in the office. Mary does not have a claim of sexual harassment because her claim would be based upon one isolated incident that is not serious enough to warrant undue concern. Um, you, you have to ask once before you know whether it's unwelcome or not. And so you always get, I guess, that first bite of the apple, so to speak. Now, if Bob had continued to ask Mary out um, after she said no, that's when it becomes potentially unwelcome. It sounds like they're peers, so even a second or third invitation is probably okay. And part of it's going to turn on how she declined. I mean, if she declined saying, oh, I'm busy that weekend, or um, I don't think I want to this week, or whatever, um, then Bob might think, oh, well, she's still open to going out with me. She just doesn't want to go out with me on this particular date. On the other hand, if Mary says, Bob, I'm just not interested in dating you, please don't ask me again, and he continues at that point, then that's going to more, more quickly become an unwanted um, sexual, potentially uh, hostile work environment situation. Let's talk about when there's been a change to the welcomeness component. So if sexual activity started out as consensual, you may recall we had that Sidori originally where there was a consensual relationship, and one employee calls a halt to it and the sexual activity continues, it can become sexual harassment at the time the activity is no longer consensual. So going back to this scenario, we may recall that um, Bob says, nope, don't want to uh, continue on, um, then that is the moment that it becomes unwelcome. Now, it's probably fairly reasonable for Mary to assume it's continuing to be welcome. I mean, it's probably not necessary, let's say they're, they're dating for a while, it's probably not necessary every time before she touches his hand to hold his hand that she says, now Bob, I'm your supervisor, are you okay if I hold your hand? Or Bob, you know, I'm your supervisor, is it still okay that I rub your back? If they're on an ongoing relationship, that would be, you know, strange to have that kind of conversation. Um, but certainly uh, when he communicates, either directly or indirectly, that he's no longer interested, then that's the time for Mary to back off, or at least to clearly ask the question and accept whatever that answer might be. Mary dated Bob, her supervisor, for three months. When she told Bob that she did not want to see him anymore, he became obsessed with her. He started emailing her at work, dropping by her house, and stalking her after work. Bob gave Mary a poor review, and eventually she was fired. Under these circumstances, Mary does have a claim for sexual harassment. It's not uh, uh, all, the point up to this point is irrelevant to the sexual harassment claim. It doesn't strengthen Mary's claim. It doesn't make it weaker. Um, it's when she says, I don't want it anymore. Everything that happened after that is what is important. So um, let's talk about Ancali. I kind of gave you an idea about it before, but let's look at it a little bit more formally. So we're now, this is actually a, an older case. This is back to the year that we had Meritor Savings. So we do need to know its name, Ancale versus Sundown Offshore Services. And um, so what is the issue? Does Title VII apply to same-sex sexual harassment? And the answer is yes. The court held that harassment is a type of discrimination based upon a protected characteristic and does not extend to non-recognized grounds, such as a person's sexual orientation. You may recall I said earlier that um, there were two ways that we could see sexual orientation be become a covered category under Title VII. 
One would be for the Congress to revise or to change the statute to include this category. The other would be for the U.S. Supreme Court to expand that definition of sex to include sexual orientation. One of the reasons why that's an unlikely solution or approach to this issue is that we have cases like Oncale where the U.S. Supreme Court seems to have already kind of answered the question. Now there's a way around that. If the U.S. Supreme Court really did decide to include sexual orientation as kind of a subcategory of sex, they could say, this is dicta. They could say, well, we didn't really need to reach a ruling in Oncale about sexual orientation. Um, and so therefore it's not a binding authority uh, of this court. So it's not, a, it, the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court wouldn't be precluded from that interpretation. But this would be one of the reasons that the U.S. Supreme Court would be unlikely to do so. It's more likely, uh, especially since this is a statute, not the U.S. Constitution, it's more likely that the U.S. Supreme Court, in my opinion, would wait for the Congress to act and follow the lead of the Congress under those circumstances. So se uh, sexual harassment, which is a type of discrimination, doesn't matter whether it's motivated by sexual desire or the lack of sexual desire. It's actionable so long as it places its victim in an objectively disadvantageous working environment regardless of the victim's gender. So again, the focus isn't on whether somebody wanted to have sex or was romantically attracted to the other person. Um, it's, the issue is whether it has to do with the person's gender. So it was motivated by gender and the victim is put in a disadvantageous position. So there are three situations that the court acknowledged could be the basis for a sexual harassment claim. First is the harasser is motivated by sexual desire. This is what we usually think of as a sexual harassment case. In fact, I would say probably 95% of sexual harassment cases fall into this category. Another category could be the harassers are just generally motivated by a dislike of the opposite gender, or at least a dislike of the opposite gender under these circumstances. For example, imagine a, a workforce, uh, maybe a bunch, a very maybe macho, uh, stereotypical environment that, um, you know, uh, or maybe traditionally only men have been in, a woman or some group of women join that work environment. The men themselves are heterosexual. They, you know, like women. They've got wives and mothers and things like that, but they don't want to work with women in this environment. And so they might be very hostile to those women. And that would be a sex harassment situation, even though there may not be any sexual attraction, any dirty jokes, any touching. It could just be hostile, like, you know, sabotaging the work or things along those lines. So that's the second category. The third category is the harassers treat one sex differently from the, from the other within a mixed sex workplace. Um, so um, the bottom line is with Oncale, it's pretty difficult to prove same sex harassment. It's much more easy to prove opposite sex harassment. Uh, than, or, or same sex harassment when the harasser is gay or lesbian because he or she is really motivated by sexual desire. That wouldn't be hard to prove. I mean, the, the, the paradigm would be the same that we saw in any other types of cases. Okay, so let's consider this uh, scenario. John is an openly gay man. He constantly teaches his coworker, Paul, telling Paul that Paul should go ahead and come out of the closet. John has even publicly commented upon how sexually attractive Paul is, though Paul has warned John against making such comments. So it appears that John is romantically sexually attracted to Paul, and he is engaging in a hostile work environment. Under these circumstances, Paul would not have a difficulty advancing a sexual harassment case, even though he and John are both males. As you can see in the snare, it's irrelevant whether Paul is gay or straight. Um, he can be the victim of sexual harassment either way. So that's not, his sexual orientation is not relevant. Okay, so let's drill down a little bit about what we mean when we talk about sexual harassment. And this is especially, uh, this, this is going to transfer, this logic is going to transfer 
to the race and the age and the disability and the religion categories as well. So the sexual element does not need does not is need not always be present to in cases to constitute sexual harassment. In other words, the focus may be on gender and not upon sex or sexual attraction. So here's an example of what I'm getting at. When a female employee is repeatedly verbally harassed about doing men's work, taking away the job a man should have, or simply inappropriately working in a traditionally male job, that behavior will constitute sexual harassment. That would be the case even if the workers uh, don't have any sexual attraction for the woman, aren't making sexual jokes, aren't touching the woman, aren't doing any of those traditional sexual harassment things. Um, it could even be women who, uh, heterosexual women who are making these comments to, to the female employee. So you can see in those situations, it's like a gender, not so much sex. So we could change it to when a African-American employee is repeatedly verbally harassed about doing a white people's work or taking away the job a white person should have or inappropriate or simply inappropriately working in a traditional white job or it could be you know a, a Muslim employee working a traditional job held by Christians or you can see so it's really not uh, you could really change any category in here not just female and uh, have that same logic apply Obviously, we're talking about anti-female animus in this situation. Negative feelings about women or women working in a particular environment. And again, this would be the same thing that we would see in a racial harassment situation, anti-Asian animus or an anti-African American animus or you know, an anti-Muslim animus or whatever the category might be. So in situations in which the harasser is abusive to both genders, so we have sometimes it's referred to as an equal opportunity abuser. Um, and in that situation, if, if Bob is the boss and he's a jerk to everyone who works for him, be they male or female, then there is no claim. Um, I'm not, I'm, obviously the HR department ought to address the situation with Bob because it's gonna result in high turnover, loss of efficiency, bad morale, uh, but there's no legal claim associated with that. But if the facts are a little different, their claim can arise. So let's say Bob is a jerk to all of his employees, but the way that he's a jerk is different. Uh, he's a jerk to, we'll say, the women employees by using sex-specific derogatory terms. So if the uh, negative comments are have a gender component to them, then that could be a, sec a sexual harassment situation. Uh, similarly, you, you could have a Bob could be a harasser and he has, we'll say, African-American and Caucasian workers. Um, he's offensive to both. He's rude to both but he uses a racially charged language. Um, and so under those circumstances now, whomever he's used the racially charged language towards would have a racial harassment claim potentially. Let's consider our scenario. Bob, the manager of a consulting firm, invariably yells at all of his employees, calling them stupid, idiot, useless, etc. When he shouts at his female staff members, he usually uses an additional word such as you stupid, fill in the blank, <laughs> or another obscene reference specific to the gender. Mary, a subordinate who is fed up with Bob's behavior, decides to file a complaint with the EOC. Mary perhaps can prevail on a hostile environment sexual harassment claim because Bob's hostility does have a component specifically directed at women. And again, if we were to change these to racial epithets or religious epithets, um, and Mary were a member of that racial group or religious group, then Mary could assert a religious harassment or racial harassment claim. Mary worked as the only female security guard among other male guards, so a traditionally male role. She was verbally harassed by her colleagues because she did a man's job. They would sometimes hide her badge and keys, grease her uniform, and break open and wreck her locker. Mary complained to her supervisor who inquired if any of the men had ever touched her. She said no, so the supervisor said, hmm, can't do anything. 
Under these circumstances, Mary does have a claim for sexual harassment because she's being harassed because of her gender, even though there's no sexual component to the harassment. Mary, Bob and Mary are both line workers for a utility company who've been working together for almost two years. So they are peers and they're working in a traditional male occupation. Bob frequently tells Mary that the job is called line man and not line woman, and thus it's not a woman's job. He plays practical jokes on her, such as hiding some of her tools and sabotaging her truck. He asks her when she plans on getting pregnant and staying at home to take care of her children and gives her copies of help wanted ads for secretarial and waitress jobs. Such behavior has kept Mary disturbed at work. If Mary complains about Bob's conduct, he will likely be found to have committed sexual harassment against Mary because the harassment was based upon Mary's gender and it unreasonably interfered with Mary's ability to do her job. So obviously many of these cases turn on a he said, she said scenario. Who are we going to believe? And if your job in, as the legal professional or as the HR professional, you'll be interviewing people. And in most of these cases, the stories don't completely jibe with one another. Um, uh, oftentimes they're called he said, she said situations. So who are you going to believe? How are you going to evaluate the situation? And so here are some things that the OC suggests you consider. I guess the first thing to say is that you shouldn't always believe the person who's making the complaint and you shouldn't always believe the person who is allegedly harassing. Um, the truth uh, sometimes is a little bit of both. Sometimes one is completely telling the truth, sometimes the other is completely telling the truth. So you should go into it with an open mind about where the truth may lie. One could be inherent plausibility. Uh, you know, there, there are sometimes you'll hear allegations that just don't make sense. Well, why did no one ever see that happen if it was happening all the time? Or, um, you know, so you have to consider, did that make sense under the circumstances? Uh, consider the details of the story and uh, see how they, they flow together. The demeanor, the person bringing the complaint and the person who's responding to the complaint. Uh, what about their body language, the, the level of detail they have. The motive to falsify, um, you know, if this is an employee who is under no disciplinary pressure, who, uh, you know, is doing a, a fine job and doesn't have anything on, her, on his or her record, hard to see exactly what that person's getting out of making this allegation. On the other hand, if this person is about to be terminated because of job, poor job performance, I mean, it could be that the decline in job performance uh, was due to the harassment, so you certain, certainly shouldn't assume that there isn't any uh, fire with the smoke, but it's also giving that person a motive, hey, I need to come up with something or I'm going to be fired. Is there corroboration or other people able to say, yeah, I saw something, I thought that was strange when that happened, or I thought she liked it, but it did happen a lot, or whatever the thing might be. Um, emails, um, other facts can be, can be corroborated, uh, video maybe, uh, uh, things along those lines. And then the past record, has this person uh, been accused of this type of behavior in the past? Has this person uh, made other complaints along these lines? Things to consider in the background. Uh, these are just kind of good common sense things to consider um, in reaching that determination. Uh, the, the key is to keep an open mind and not to come in with any particular assumptions. One thing that's important when you're doing the investigations is to keep the, the list of people who know about it to an absolute minimum. This is important for lots of reasons. One is that uh, the person making the complaint is oftentimes, well actually both parties are oftentimes very embarrassed. They want as few people to know about this as possible. That, that's true whether they're telling the truth or they're lying in most cases. And so we want to respect the privacy of the individuals uh, no matter who's telling the truth. Also, if you keep it quiet, um, then when people come in and interview with you, you're, you're less likely to um, be hearing a rehash of what some, uh, someone else's testimony might be. You're more likely to get you know, the, the, the straight scoop of this person's recollection. Um, so witness testimony is going to be less altered by having heard the same story. Oh, well, I heard Bob tell me this, but Sally told me this, and Teresa told me this, and Larry told me this. You want to keep 
the testimony pure what this person has actually said. So you want to keep it definitely on a need to know basis. And for the most part, your witnesses only don't really need to know anything. You're asking them questions. Now, certainly the questions that you ask are going to probably paint them a bit of a picture, but if they don't need to be interviewed, they don't need to know anything about it. If it ends up that you need to terminate somebody, you certainly don't tell people why you're terminating them. Uh, if it's necessary in the workplace, you might say this person is no longer in our employee, but many times that's not even necessary to say. And so you don't want to say this person is guilty of sexual harassment. As a result of sexual harassment investigations, it's not uncommon for the HR person to discover that the uh, environment, the culture in the workplace was inappropriate, maybe sexually charged. Under those circumstances, it's pretty common for the, the HR department to say, let's retrain everybody in our policies, let's do a reminder. And so that can be one way of responding to it. And uh, certainly if an employee says, well, why are we being retrained? Uh, the HR person can say, well, it's, it's periodic that we do these retrain, retraining or uh, we became aware there might be some, some concerns in the department. There's lots of different ways of handling it, but you don't want to say, well, we're going through this retraining because Teresa made a complaint. That wouldn't be a good plan. The love contract. Um, the, the, the textbook author liked this idea um, and spent kind of an unusual amount of time on this idea. Um, this isn't something in my practice that I uh, dealt with. Um, so uh, I don't really think they're that common. Um, I, I can see the utility. Uh, uh, the idea is that by having both parties sign this, that it's going to protect the employer because it's obvious if they're both signing it that it's a welcome relationship and you're explaining to both parties, hey, when it ceases to become a welcome relationship, you need to let somebody know. And so I can see that it could provide the employer with a bit of cover, a little bit of protection. Um, I also think it's a very kind of artificial way of handling these types of scenarios. Uh, some employers prohibit dating relationships within an organization. That's one approach. Um, the upside with that is that probably there's less dating. And so in some sense, there is less uh, inappropriate behavior. But the reality is that there's probably going to be at least some continued dating. It's just going to be undercover. And so in that sense, it's sometimes more difficult to sort through and figure out what was welcome and what was not welcome because no one was able to be public about it. And so if one person was uh, uh, pressuring another person to have some kind of romantic or sexual relationship, the fact that these relationships were prohibited anyway adds a layer of, of uncertainty to the whole relationship. So there, there are you, I, I can understand an employer prohibiting them. I can understand an employer permitting them. Um, some allow uh, coworkers to date, but not uh, supervisor subordinate relationships. Uh, the important thing I think is that the employer have a policy about this and that that policy be communicated to the workers and that it be consistently applied. Um, so what are we looking for when we talk about it? If you decide to do something like a love contract, obviously the way that it would work would be, um, typically this would be in a subordinate uh, uh, su superior type of situation. Uh, the superior would likely raise this with HR and say, hey, I am thinking about dating or about to date, you know, the subordinate, but I want to make sure everything is consensual and above board and, and I'm required to report this to HR. So HR would prepare a document that would explain or reiterate, hey, both people are entering this wel uh, on a welcome basis. They both want to be in this relationship. If it changes for other, either party, the, the party should let the other person know. Um, if the other person doesn't seem to accept that decision, then the, the party who no longer wants to participate needs to contact HR uh, so that it's clear and that, that the whole complaint procedure is specified very clearly. 
It is designed to control the risk factors that the employer has. Um, it um, can be useful, but I wouldn't say that it completely protects an employer. So it's kind of just one tool that an employer might want to use. When there's a power differential, um, when your boss, you're dating your boss, and then you decide you don't want to date your boss, but your boss really still wants to date you, I don't know that a love contract is going to necessarily persuade that person that they can just go to HR and somehow the problem's all going to be magically fixed. Um, so if, I'm not sure that it's completely sol solving the problem. Um, either I don't know that it really reflects human nature and I don't know that it really reflects, a, it certainly would not completely solve the problem, though it might reduce the risk somewhat. Let's consider a scenario. So Mary is a management assistant at the bank. She's involved in a romantic relationship with Bob, who's a senior person at the bank. Though the relationship between Mary and Bob is very strong, Bob is concerned that he and the bank might be accused of sexual harassment at some point in the future. Okay, now again, I'll, I'll stop here and say, if Bob is really thinking this, I'm not sure the relationship is so very strong, but that's just me, okay? <laughs> the director of HR recommends that Bob and Mary sign a love contract. Though it may not be a perfect solution to liability for sexual harassment, this contract may restate the voluntary nature of the relationship and assure Mary the decisions regarding employment will not be influenced by the end of their relationship. Now, one thing I will say about the love contract, I would recommend you not call it the love contract because that's a really stupid name for it. Uh, maybe a uh, uh, dating contract or something along those lines, some other name than love contract. But again, it could provide some level of protection, um, almost like a premarital premarital or a yeah, premarital agreement or something. And premarital agreements are more binding than this love contract thing would be. So at this point, we have completed our first two topics. We've done an introduction to sexual harassment, kind of giving the, a little bit of the history, and we've talked about the two categories of sexual harassment, quid pro quo and hostile work environment. In our next uh, uh, lecture, we'll cover in more detail the employer liability aspects as well as tort and criminal claims that sometimes arise in the context of sexual harassment. Um, as always, if you have questions about the material that we've covered today, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is cgroover at colin.edu, or better yet, come by my office hours so we can talk in more detail. I'd be delighted to explore these ideas in more, uh, more detail with you if you would like. Um, so, and also be sure to watch the next lecture. I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day.